Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the eighth meeting of the in 2016 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Everyone, please, is reminded to switch off their mobile phones. No apologies have been received. Today, we have one item on the agenda, the first of four evidence sessions on the committee's review of priorities for crofting reform. We recognise as a committee that a considerable amount of work has already been undertaken to identify potential improvements to crofting legislation. What we as a committee want to do is hear from a range of those with an interest in crofting to allow us to make an assessment of the priority action that has so far been identified and to make recommendations on any action it, we consider necessary to progress and complement the reform process. Now, we are all conscious there are very, some very contentious issues uh, regarding crofting at the moment that are being discussed in the media and elsewhere at the present time. The committee does not intend to stray into these specific areas and I would urge all committee members and indeed witnesses to focus on the legislative priorities rather than personalities. So I'd like to welcome to the panel and I hope I'm going to get all these uh, pronunciations right and I I, I hope I do. First of all, Lucy Sumson from the Crofting Policy Manager and Regional Manager for Argyll and the Islands, NFU, Scotland. Patrick Krauss from the Chief Executive of the Scottish Crofting Federation. Donald McKinnon, uh, Scottish Crofting Federation Young Crofters. Peter Peacock, Policy Director of Community Land Scotland. And Murray McShane, Chair of the Crofting Policy Group, Scottish Land and Estates. Good morning to you all. Can I ask each of the witnesses briefly to outline the work their organisations do as in relation uh, to crofting? And, and, and probably... Do, do, let's start with you, Murray. Do you want to go first? Yes, good morning. Um, Scottish Land and Estates is a membership body. And in this context... Uh, our organisation represents the interest of landowners, not uh, exclusively by any means uh, large landed estate owners with a crofting interest. Um, Scottish Land and Estates has a membership which includes owner-occupier crofters, um, which can be of a very, very small uh, nature in, in terms of land size and value. Um, we, we're, a, we're a membership organisation primarily representing the, the interests of of uh, our group. My position, I've very recently become chair uh, of the, the crofting group this year. My background is that I am not a landowner, uh, I'm not a crofter, uh, but I am a solicitor in private practice and a lot of the work uh, which I do and my practice does relates to crofting law and we represent crofters and landowners. Thank you very much. Patrick. Hello, good morning. Um, I'm with the Scottish Crofting Federation, which used to be the Scottish Crofters Union. Um, we still operate to, a, to an extent as a, as a union in that we're a representative body. Um, we're the only organisation that is dedicated to representing crofters and crofting, i.e. that's all we do is, is, is crofters and crofting. Um, we also have widened our remit since 2001 to, to we now do development work as well. So, so we're not simply a representative organisation. We're also a crofting development organisation. And we, uh, our two main um, development projects at the moment are a crofting skills training course and crofting connections, which some of you will be familiar with, working with young people. Thank you, Donald. Um, morning. Um, I'm representing the S Scottish Crofting Federation Young Crofters Group. Um, we're a branch of Patrick's organisation, um, but we, we're seeking to highlight the issues that particularly affect young crofters. Um, and we've identified those as access to homes, um, land and jobs uh, in the crofting areas. And these are the three areas that we really try and um, promote and look for solutions so that we can encourage more young people to get into crofting. And for those who are already involved, to stay, stay part of crofting. Thank you very much, Donald. Lucy? 
Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, so I'm policy manager covering crofting for the National Farmers Union of Scotland, um, which, uh, like both SLE and SCF, is a membership organisation. Um, we have, across the whole of Scotland, about 8,500 members, but we do have um, over just under 800 crofting, specific crofter members. But we also have um, landlords who are members and also farmers who have a crofting interest. So quite often we will have farmers who also have a croft as well. Um, we have our Crofting Highlands Alliance Committee, which I provide the chair for, uh, the secretariat for, and Sandy Murray, who is our chair, should have been here today, but um, he's unfortunately on holiday, so you've got me instead. Um, so we do um, do a um, significant amount of work with our crofting members, and we just completed a survey from, from them, which I might share with you some of the results of that later on today. Thank you, Lucy. Peter. Thank you, Community. Um, community Land Scotland represents the growing number of uh, new community landowners in Scotland. We've got, we're, we're only about six years old as an organisation, so we're much younger than, the, apart from Donald, of the, uh, as, as an organisation than the other parties represented here. We've got a growing membership of about 70 plus members now. Uh, and within that membership, we've only in comparatively recently discovered that uh, over 20% of Scotland's crofts exist on community-owned land. So we're taking a closer interest in crofting as an issue for our members because the health of crofting very much determines the health of the, of the or, or significantly influences the health of the communities that uh, our members are, are owning and managing. Uh, I just want to make it clear we are not representing crofters. We don't have a, a, a remit to represent crofters, but crofting landlords in the context of community ownership. Um, and the work that we've been doing recently has been trying to work out from our members' point of view, what is crofting there to do in the 21st century? What does it do to serve the ambitions of our community owners? What would need to change to serve those ambitions better? Uh, and what, therefore, the limited number of things that we think ought to change in crofting to, to support those ambitions. So we've got a quite narrow focus at, at the present times, partly because of our organisational resources, but we'll get into the detail of all of that, I'm sure, uh, as the conversation goes on. OK, thank you very much. I mean, if, I'm sure you're all well aware of how, how, how this process works, is that there will be some questions put, and we, I will try... To get, to get you all in to, to say your bit on every question. It, it's a question of managing time and to get through all the questions. So I, I'll try and give you all, all, all equal opportunity to say something. If, if there's something that you feel is very important and you, and you want to uh, uh, come in, I just make sure you catch my eye and, and I'll try and bring you in. Um, so the first question, uh, I think, is from Rhoda. Thank you and good morning. Um, the Crofting Reform Act in 2010 um, changed the role of the Crofters Commission, indeed changed its name as well, to the Crofting Commission rather than the Crofters Commission. Um, how successful do you think that has been? Does there need to be changes to that role again going forward? Who, who wants to lead on that? Okay, Patrick. I'll have a go at it. <coughs> um, it's, an, it's a very interesting question because I think the two answers are yes and no. The, the, it, the SCF wanted there to be a majority elected um, crofters, crofting commission. I think it actually changed its name partly because of the fact that we changed ours from crofters union to crofting federation um, with the idea that the remit was going to be wider um, and that the commission was there for crofting, as the federation is there for crofting. Um, I think in light of what's happened recently, it's shown that there does need to be a, a review of the commission, and we feel that the, the suggestions put forward by the Committee of Inquiry on Crofting, led by Professor Shucksmith um, in 2007, I think the report came out. We really need to look at that report and keep it live because the um, suggestions that he had for how regulation um, can work and how the commission can work being much more devolved, I think, bears a lot of, of value still, and we should be looking, looking at that. I mean, our, our opinion is that partly what has gone wrong with the commission is due to it still being very centralised um, to there being too few people taking too much responsibility over um, 
decisions that should be happening at a more local level. Lucy. Um, I think that what I agree with what Patrick said. I think the other element um, of change that happened when the, uh, within the Crofting Commission was that it lost its developmental role. Um, that was transferred um, to Highlands Alliance Enterprise, although when the transfer was made, it was moved from crofting development to crofting community development. Um, and I think a number of organisations have felt that um, that maybe hasn't been uh, to the benefit of crofters and, and or crofting. Um, and it has been raised at the cross-party group on a number of occasions. Um, interestingly, in the survey that I said that we just completed, um, which I've just done a sort of bit of basic number crunching, <coughs> Um, we asked a question, was, uh, did we, our members think that there was a role for a single organisation dedicated to crofting development, which would be able to give advice and information to individual crofters and crofting communities, as well as promoting the wider interests of, Scot of crofting. Um, and of the respondents, 67% um, were in favour of that. And interestingly enough, 57% were in favour of it being within the crofting commission, or so going back to the crofting commission. Um, and only 17% um, suggested high, and there was a sort of random selection of others, including one of which was DEFRA, which I thought was interesting. But <laughs> um, so I think it, you know, that whole issue of development and, and how crofting is, is taken forward um, is, is, is muddled at the moment and isn't very clear. Peter, do you want to...? Yeah, I, I, I suppose in many ways, if the question's about the 2010 Act in general, or the Commission in particular, but I'll maybe address both, but in terms of the 2010 Act in general, I think it's probably too early to see how successful or otherwise it's been in many respects because a large chunk of it was about registering crofts and registering common grazings and all the procedures around that. Uh, and that's underway and it's progressing. And, and whilst there are anxieties that people have about some of that in terms of the, the, the amount of effort that has to go into doing it, it's not, the, it's not the talk of the steamy, so to speak, that this is a problem necessarily. So from that point of view, it's probably quite early in, in its life as an act to work out whether that's right or not. The other point, the point I was going to raise is the one that Lucy has just raised about crofting development, because that's something that, there, that I think there is a clear gap on, and our members are anxious about that, because the transfer, the, 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 sorry, the, the focusing of the role of the Commission on, on purely regulation by the 2010 Act and moving away from that general view and general, general development of crofting, uh, that development role uh, ostensibly passed to High, but as Lucy said, High have either interpreted it uh, or been told to interpret it, I'm not sure which, that it was about the development of crofting communities, not the development of crofting. And that means that people aren't addressing the, the, the modern art of how do you do crofting? What are the technical requirements? What's the best practice? What's the advice that you need to do certain things on crofting? How do you diversify? How do you, you know, make more income from your croft? And all that kind of work uh, where crofters uh, and, and therefore the crofting community would benefit from that by improving how you do crofting, then I think there is a big gap in that. And uh, we would like to see that gap filled. It is an open question how you do it. I mean. Uh, we don't have a view particularly on that. I mean, it could remain at high, but that, or it could go to the, you know, the agricultural colleges. It could be a contract that's put out by government. Um, you know, it could go to a number of places. But I guess the principal point to make is that there is, from our members' point of view, a definite gap uh, in that crofting development uh, uh, function. I suppose that the wider question, if you may not want to get into this, just now, Camina, but Rhoda Grant's question, you know raises this in one sense, and, and Patrick touched on it to some extent, there is, I don't think there's any doubt there's a, a debate beginning to happen or is happening within crofting beyond the technicalities and the legalities about do we need all this regulation? Uh, isn't it, or is it, or isn't it holding back the system? Questions about um, is it time to think about decentralising some of the decision making that the Commission currently has. I don't think there's any doubt that if you go around the Highlands and Islands, there is a difference of perception in between Shetland, for example, and the Western Isles about what crofting is and what its current features are. Uh, and therefore, people... I don't want to go too far down that line, okay, because, well, we, fine. Peter, we are actually going to come that's to the, re uh, the regulation. Okay, and, and, I, and I think you've identified a very important point, but, and you'll very much get a chance to come in on that, and, and how that regulation fits in with regional variation variations is very important. So could I stop you there without taking away anything from what you've said and, and ask Murray if he'd like to come in? I want to echo what Lucy said and what Peter said about the developmental role which was taken from the, the, the Commission and I think there's a clear gap 
there just now that, that more could be done uh, in that respect. At a, a higher level, um, Scottish Land and Estates is interested in sustainability, is interested in openness, and is interested in predictability. And uh, those words, to some extent, inform the idea which has emerged from what Patrick said and what Peter's saying around decentralisation. When things start to be decentralised, um, local democracy is great. All, no, no one in the room would say that that's a, that's a bad idea. But if that's where the ultimate decision-making process is centred, then you may get one policy applied in Shetland and a different policy applied in Mull or in Isla or in central Inverness. That's the benefit of having one place, which is currently the Crofton Commission, eh, around that. In relation to detail, uh, Rhoda, your, your, your question asks about um, ha has it been good? There are elected, uh, six I think, elected members of the, the Crofton Commission. Anecdotally, uh, I've heard it said that there could be clarification around whether these members are there to represent a constituency or whether they are just put there because a constituency <coughs> has elected them. And there's been some confusion uh, around that in the crofting public, if, if I can put it like that, and perhaps on the point of the members as well. Query whether there is need for other specialist representatives on the, the Crofting Commission. Now, I raise that because uh, Scottish Land and Estates um, recognise that there is an appointed member, not an elected member, for landowners' interests already there on the Commission. And if they have a representative there, should there not be, or could there, could there be room for, for, for other places? Just one, one other uh, point. I want to commend the work that the, the, the Scottish Crofting Federation do. Peter talked about the need for people to be promoting crofting. I know that Patrick's organisation does a great job uh, in doing that, and that, that, that's got to be commended. So it's, it's wrong to present a picture that nobody is talking about development or, or promotion of, of crofting. Um, yeah, I, I think the other thing that uh, I, I would say is it's good that there is a, a one-stop place for it, if at all possible. By definition, you have before you five representatives, four, four, four of different organisations today. So is the system completely broken as it currently is? I, I don't think so. Are there improvements could be made with the Crofting Commission and how it functions? Absolutely. OK. But before I come back to Reddit, Donald, I mean, representing the future um, here, you'll definitely have views about, about how crofting could be developed and encouraged. Do you want to share those at this stage or would you like to share um, them later on? Well, I'd just kind of like to echo the, the rest of the, the panel, really, that um, I think the increase in democracy, you know, the elected commissioners has been a positive thing. Um, and um, it's led to an increase, hopefully, in accountability um, for those elected commissioners, um, which SEF Young Crofters um, uh, welcomes. Um, but I don't, I'm also concerned about the development aspect of things and like to know more about what HIE are actually doing um, for the development of crofting and whether that has been a, um, a positive move or not, um, because I think it's very unclear at the moment. Donald, when, when we see them, we will definitely be asking them as a result of this session. Ready, do you want to follow up on that before I go to Stuart? Yes, I if, if I can just have two follow-ups, yeah. if that's yes. okay. Um, first, on the role of elected members, and there, there seems to be a concern that their role is maybe not that clear. Are they representatives of a constituency, or are they elected on to a commission to provide a different role that is not answerable to that constituency. I think that makes it quite difficult for elected commissioners <coughs> to work. Um, would you want to see a change to that role to make it clearer as to, and if their role is part, as, as commissioners first and foremost, um, does elections work in, on that basis? You know, wh where does that all tie in? I'd be interested to hear. Um, I, I see that Murray's catching my eye and, 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 and and just remind everyone that we're talking about roles and, and very happy to uh, direct Murray on, on, on asking that when, or ref, reminding him of that when he asks, responds. 
Ju Julie noted, convener, I, I wasn't <laughs> going to stray. <laughs> At least I didn't, I, di I didn't intend to. Um, when you have elected people there, there's the tendency for things to become partisan. But I said earlier that it's good that there is a central organisation um, geographically. It doesn't have to be located in Inverness. It happens to be located in Inverness because it's the easiest place to get to across the Crofton counties. But it's good that there are people who come from different constituencies, if I can put it like that, in its, in its broadest possible sense, into a central body. Query, and perhaps there's a need for more evidence on this uh, in the process that's underway just now, whether the roles could be cl more clearly defined as to whether they are there to represent interest, because I think under the current system, they're not. They're just put there because they have been elected, but they've got a bigger remit, which is beyond their own specific interest. Now, I'm sure Patrick's got a, a view that he'll be happy to share around the empowerment of local communities uh, in that. And it needs to be clear, clear air, whether that is the role of the Crofton Commissioner, if he's there representing his, his local constituency, if you like, uh, or whether he's there with a bigger interest to say, well, I've been given an election, I'm here, and that's the end of it. I'm not the member for Rosher and Sutherland, um, or Central Highlands, whatever it happens to be to be carved up to be. But I think there's a need for, for maybe more evidence on that before there's a knee-jerk reaction to say, well, policy should be, we abolish something that's central, central uh, and go down a, a devolved um, way. Because in terms of the Scottish Parliament's intentions and oversights for that, um, I think it would be much more difficult if the system just now, and we're going to come on to this later, I'm sure, if the system's difficult to understand just now, when you have a plethora of different decision-making bodies, it becomes it's just so much harder. So it doesn't need to be made more complicated than, than it is already. I'm not sure if that directly has answered your question, um, but that's what I offer. No, I noticed Patrick nodding, so he'll probably want to come in. And, and what I would say is... I don't want to stifle conversation. I'm, I'm conscious just we're on question one and we're at 20 past 10, so th there's 14 questions or 15 questions without supplementaries in front of you. So we, 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 I would like to move on, but I'd like to ask you to make uh, quick comments. So Patrick and, and then... Yes. My second piece, which kind of ties into that, because we have commissioners who are there unelected and not representative. We have different forms of crofting in different places. People say if you croft in Shetland and croft in Skye, it's totally different things. Is there a way, rather than devolving the powers of the commission locally, is there a way of making commissioners more responsive to their electorate and, and reflective of their electorate when looking at how the legislation is and, and how things are regulated so that the crofting commission can be responsive to each of those different ways of crofting rather than having mini commissions all over the place, I suppose, is what I'm trying to kind of get thoughts about. Pat Patrick, do you want to follow up and then I'll give Peter a chance to come in? Yeah, this <coughs> it's quite difficult to keep, to keep a short answer to this, but I'll certainly try. I, the way I look at it, and again, going back to Shuck Smith, um, there wasn't going to be no central body, but those people in, in the central body were there on the mandate of their localities. And I think <clears throat> I'm very much of the opinion that when the, the majority um, move in a direction, there's, there's not a lot of point in trying to stand in the way and say, no, 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 it's not like this. And... The fact that people think that the commissioners are there as local representatives, I think, is justification enough to actually make them local representatives. Because all crofters think that the commissioners are there because they elected them, therefore they are there as our local representative. So it would make sense that the commissioners are local representatives. And to give them a clearer mandate, I think the devolution part of it would be just that there, that there needs to be clearer local groups that, that are um, having discussions on the things that they want their commissioner to put forward to the commission. 
So I don't think it has to be a very complicated system. It's just about people meeting and talking to each other and giving those commissioners a mandate. Um, something that, that there's just two, two small points that I need to make. One is that I don't think that the, the way that it, the, the commission is described should be in, in primary legislation because we're stuck now. Supposing at, at, at this point where we're going into the second election, we were thinking about doing it differently. But supposing we made the decision now to, to say, right, okay, they're going to be local representatives. We can't do that without changing primary legislation, which is crazy. You know, so, so, so in the legislation, there should be the intention of what we want the commission to be, but with the flexibility that, that in secondary legislation or, or, or however it, it, it works in, in a bureaucratic sense, we can change it and say, right, for this election, we're going to do it differently without having to change primary legislation. And the other point I wanted to make is, is that I think that the um, commissioners are far too involved in administration and um, the actual workings of the commission. You know, in, in, in th this whole, I, I, I was nearly getting specific about what's happening at the moment, but in, <laughs> in a broad sense, commissioners shouldn't be sitting in local meetings and making decisions at, at local meetings. Um, this is something that we have trained people in the commission to do. Um, and so I would like to suggest that the model of, of board governance that's used in the third sector is a model that, that would be much more applicable, that, that the commissioners should be there as a board and their duties are to ensure that the commission is following its, its remit, that it's, it's um, carrying out its objectives, that it's staying legal, that it's being prudent, etc., etc. The, the, the rules that the trustees of third sector organisations have to abide by. I think we understand what you're saying there. Can I, mm -hmm. Peter, can I ask you, I'd like to bring you in, but can I ask you to keep uh, with your skills uh, as an orator to keep it as short as possible, please? That's very, very noble of you. <laughs> um, I, 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 the point I was going to make was that in thinking back to the 2010 Act and the kind of conversations around that and uh, the desirability of having elected uh, commissioners, it was, a, it was in a sense to make sure that the commissioners were attuned the crofters, that they understood them because they came and they were elected by uh, them and they were ultimately accountable to them. And, so, and it, was, it also provided for a geographic, a guaranteed geographic representation on, on the commission. The, the, the tension comes, it seems to me, that, that the role they are nonetheless performing, notwithstanding they are elected, uh, those that are elected, is as a regulator. It's not as a, in a body with wide discretion. It's not like being in a local authority where you can make policy and make choices. You can make choices about how you regulate in terms of, you know, do we push absenteeism or purge on absenteeism for a while or do we push, you know, registering common grazing or whatever it happens to be as an activity. But you fundamentally, you can't change the law. You're there to, you know, to make sure that the regulation uh, is implemented, but you do it with the, the sensitivity you have of being elected by crofters and being attuned to their interests and needs. I think it's the only regulator I can think of that's got an elected component. So there's a fundamentally different um, you know, set of dynamics within the Commission than would be in, in any other uh, elected body, I would have thought. So can, can I just clarify, Peter, I understand what you're saying, but, but Patrick has said that, that he believes that they should have an oversight, the, the Commissioners, and, and, and help the Commission uh, perform their jobs without getting too uh, involved in issues uh, individually. Is that what you're proposing as well? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't really thought about that, to be honest. But I mean, you know, this is from not my knowledge within Community Land Scotland, but my broader knowledge of having you know, dealt with some of these matters over the years, that actually one of the best functions the commission, commissioners used to perform was to go out to local meetings and sort out issues in the village hall and hear cases and hear what was happening. And that, that seemed to deliver outcomes that people saw, witnessed, were able to make representations into and could see the decisions. So I'm not entirely sure that I would go along with Patrick in that sense. But I mean, this, this, is, a, you know, this, is, a, this is a big topic in its own right. And uh, you know, it would require an awful lot more discussion before you could, I think, alight on a change to the current system. But, it, but, but you know, the fundamental tension is between is, a, is a, an elected regulator. Uh, thank you. I, I, I'm, 
I'm conscious it's a big issue, and, and, and I think the committee will need to deliberate on that and, and come to, to a view on it in due course. And without wanting to stifle, because I know there are members, uh, the people that want to come in, um, and I, I'm going to have to just, if I may, just move this on, because I, John Finney's got a very important question on uh, which he'd like to ask as well. Thank you. Uh, good morning, panel. I'd like to ask about the Register of Crofts. Uh, Peter's already mentioned it, and uh, we know it's a process that's underway and it covers assignation, decrofting, and subletting it. Just can I have you, the panel's views on the operation of it so far, please? Who's going to go first? Uh, Peter, why don't you start first? The only point I would make is that because it's not something I hear about every day from our members, I guess it's going okay. I mean, it's not something that's absolutely... Sorry? You referred to anxiety. Uh, well, I mean, pe uh, people, people, you know, it's quite, it's quite challenging to do some of this and, and doing common gracings and so on is quite challenging. Yeah. But those who have done it, they're seeing, you know, they've now got cl clarity about certain situations. But, I mean, it's not something that, that I certainly am hearing from our members that this is a big problem and it ought to be fundamentally changed or anything. No, I think it's people are learning how to do it. They're learning from experience. It is happening progressively. And... Uh, uh, so I, I, don't, I don't rate it as a big issue right now in that, in that sense. Thank you. Lucy, would you like to come um, Well, really, it was a question from Mr Finney. It's a point of clarification in terms of there's the Register of Crofts, which is held by the Crofting Commission, <coughs> and then there's the Crofting Register, which is held by Registers of Scotland, which is to do with the mapping, etc. So it's Thank a mapping. Thank please. Do you have a comment on that? <laughs> yes. Having um, clarified, you've had a moment to gather your thoughts. <laughs> um, I mean, Patrick may be saying more because they were more involved in some of the community mapping that, that went on. But certainly from um, our members' point of view, I think that the costs of doing it are something that they're concerned about. Also that um, any challenge can only be done through the land court, um, which for many is quite a sort of foreboding thought, and, and they just don't go down that route. I think it's early days yet on, on it. Um, one of the specific um, issues that was raised, and again, this was something that was in primary legislation, which is problematic, is the whole issue of having to advertise twice in local papers. It's been raised in the Sump report, and it, it just seems to be over-bureaucratic, really, um, to ask crofters to, to jump through those hoops. Um, a lot of people will not have thought of yet because it hasn't been, you know, they haven't had to add a trigger event that will in, in, enable them to, to register. Um, I think something that still is outstanding and we might come on to if we come on to talk about common grazings is the mapping of the common grazings. Um, and again, yeah, Patrick... Exactly yeah. Grazings, you may be assured of that, but, but slightly later on, if but, I may leave but it But specifically about the mapping is that there was funding initially to map the whole of uh, all common grazings and the Commodity Commission were going to do that. I think there have been um, serious implications in terms of the resource that's taken to do that. Um, and now the, the funding has, well, certainly for the moment, been withdrawn, so there are now no, no more common grazings being mapped. Um, and I think there's certainly a disappointment from some people who are in the process, and also there's an awful lot of common grazing still to be done. Uh, I'm just working along the thing. Donald, do you want to come in? And yeah, just picking up on Lucy's point about the public notification in the press, um, I think as well as being overly bureaucratic, um, that also represents a huge amount of money coming out of crofting. Um, it costs, costs a lot to put a wee notice in, um, in the local paper, and I think it needs to be looked at whether that's really necessary or not. Pat Patrick, do you want to... um, <coughs> Lucy mentioned community mapping. Uh, we're still very much of the um, opinion that, that the register should be being populated through community mapping. Um, getting groups together in in village halls to look at their assets and um, using it as a development exercise um, as well as a legislative um, <coughs> exercise. So, so we still think there should be a lot more community mapping going on and that the government should be helping with this. Um, I know registers of Scotland do actually have somebody, a project manager, but that's, that's not enough. One person giving a, a bit of advice on community mapping isn't, isn't what we were talking about. We want some hands-on, you know, trained people actually going out and helping communities to map and using mediators to, to resolve the, the disputes that inevitably come up. Um, the adverts thing, I would just add, add to that because we're very much against this two adverts. But I would say, again, why is that in primary legislation? You know, an act as prescriptive as this, as, you know, an act saying you will place two adverts is, is crazy. Um, th there's been quite a lot of complaints that we've heard of people saying that there's not enough information on the, the um, crofting register. 
um, that information theoretically lies on the register of Crofts, but examples are um, things like access, access rights on Crofts, um, number of shareholders, who are the shareholders? You know, that information should be very easy to access through the Crofting register, you know, which is online, so you can see the map, but you don't know who, who the shareholders are or what rights there are attached to that Croft that, 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 that there is the boundary of. And then the last thing is the grazings need, need to be mapped. Uh, Murray, do you want to...? to Se several points, if, if I may, convener. Um, starting with Patrick, last point about transparency. Make no mistake, we are on a road. Uh, we're on a journey as far as the Crofting Register is concerned. And not unrelated to this is the Land Register of Scotland. And the sooner the two registers are complete, the better. That will take at least another 10 years. But the process has been started. It's, it's not like the, the old Turoni sketch, if you were going to get there, well, I wouldn't start from here. <coughs> we are where we are, um, and it's good. I think there is a lot more information, like Patrick has said, that can be added to the register at, at a later stage. But the, the question that Mr Finney asks is, is around, are there problems uh, with the, the, the crofting register? There's one major problem, and that is that the registration of the common grazings has ground to a crashing halt. At the recent uh, stakeholders group, questions were asked about why that is, the, the Crofting Stakeholders Group, and it was explained that it was because there is a lack of funding between Registers of Scotland and the Crofting Commission. We are in the phase now where I think 333 or so of the however many common grazings there are, and someone in the room might have the statistics mo mo more than I have, but about 333 have been registered. We're now about to embark upon the hard cases. We're dealing with the Crofting communities where there is disagreement, where there is a need for what Patrick says uh, of a mediator to come in and to deal with these, these, these problems. But we'll never really be able to have a full and proper discussion until the crofting register is complete. So one tangible thing that this morning I would say that the, the, the Scottish Parliament can consider, uh, this committee can consider, is the funding for com common grazing uh, registration. That, that is far and away, and because we're going to talk about this later on, it underlines the, the importance of all of that, that one of the serious priorities should, should be get, getting that register complete. Mention was made about um, the Land Court. As a solicitor in private practice, I've had a, I represented appeal number eight and appeal number 16, and I've got another case pending before the Scottish Land Court just now about common grazings. Uh, yeah, about common grazings. Does the system work? Uh, yes. We've got a tried and tested way of appealing that's there. It's not complicated. It may be perceived to be expensive and cumbersome, but it doesn't have to be. And when it's, anecdotally, I can tell you, as soon as a case is put into court, what happens? If people have got pockets deep enough, they might manage to, to slog it out. But usually it gets resolved very, very quickly. And th that's helpful. It, it, it's a good system. It is not broken. We are on, we're on that road uh, to, to getting it uh, complete. As far as the cost of adverts are concerned, well, unless there's a control put on the free market and what a press, press agency is going to cha challenge, uh, ch charge, beg your pardon, that's not going to change unless the system's changed. If you change the system now, when there's so many uh, red, crofts all regist registered already and we're sitting around 3,000 of um, 19,422, so that gives you an idea of the scale of where we are, in terms of cross registration, if you change the system now, is that fair on the people who have registered already? I don't know. It depends what you're trying to achieve. If the goal is getting the Croft register complete, then maybe it does need to be looked at. Uh, I, I know John has wanted to come back. The Cabinet Secretary is coming in, so I'm sure the question of funding will be raised um, with him. John, sorry. Thank you. It's a, it's a very br brief question. I, I'm, I'm conscious with others. Is there any role for High in any of that mediating that you, you say is required regarding this issue at all? Yes. No, well, I, th I think we should be using uh, uh, a, a mediation organisation, and there are several really good community mediation organisations in Scotland. I, I don't see a role for high in it. No. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Um, Stuart, I think you're next. Uh, thank you. Um, 30 seconds of indulgence, Kevina. My signature as Minister 
uh, is on the Crofting Commission Election Scotland Regulations 2011. And I just direct Patrick, uh, perhaps in that piece of legislation, um, there might be the ability to change things which he's suggesting needs primary legislation. The schedule defines the constituencies, how many they are and what their scope is. Um, it defines section 16, you can only stand in one constituency. And it also requires candidates to submit a couple of hundred words of a statement to which they might be held accountable by their electorates later. I'll now move to my question, if I may, uh, convener. Um, which, very close, then. Very close. Um, Basically, uh, one of the things that we, we set out to be deal with was absentee land uh, crofters and uh, neglect of uh, crofts. Um, the the old uh, uh, croft, old arrangements and the new have sought to address this. How successful have we been? Should we be doing more? Um, I've been pretty good at starting at one end and, 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 and working along. So I'm now going to start in the middle and work outwards. Lucy, would you like to lead on that? If you, have you got something to say on that? Uh, yes, um, thank you. Um, when uh, the NFU Scotland uh, put in our submission to um, the, the 2010 Bill Act, I suppose it was, um, we were very much in mind it wasn't um, absenteeism per se, it was activity that was the important bit. Um, and I think that is still our opinion. Um, I mean, I think the, the Crofting Commission have put resources into their um, uh, pursuit of absenteeism, um, but I think the issue of neglect and underutilisation is, is, is more significant in many cases. Um, and I think often, you know, that may be well be what is stopping young crofters being able to access um, crofts is, is the neglect um, and not making use of crofts. Um, I think there's issues there around succession and enabling people to move out of crofts. Um, I think there's also issues about um, allowing people to have multiple use of, 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 of a number of crofts um, to make an, an economically viable um, case. Um, I think activity is a difficult one to define, and I think one of the problems is that, the, as we know from the farming, farming and recent cap negotiations, um, and I think that's partly why the Commission may not have tackled it before now, is just, A, resources, but actually, you know, how do you go onto a croft and judge whether it's, it's neglect or not? Um, and I think there's a lot of work to be done about how you actually define activity. It's for, for crofting, it's not just purely agricultural. There are whole multiple uses of crofting these days. But certainly, I think the neglect aspect is, is a significant bit. Can I just come back before going to others on specifically? <laughs> Do you not consider that the economic value derived from crofting should also be attached to the community, which is a, a broader community than a single croft heir or croft? Uh, in other words, that the person who's deriving the benefit from the crofting activity should be part of that community by residence. Um, Sorry, can I just clarify? What, you, what you're asking to define is a comment on, on the 32... <coughs> Uh, kilometre restriction I mean, the NF, and whether the, you think that's important. Is yes, that right? Yes, the, the NFU are, are saying the important part is the activity, not where the person who derives benefit from the activity is risen. And I'm just saying, is that really what you're trying to say? No, I think, and I think the two go in hand in hand because, I mean, obviously one of the recognitions of the value of crofting is, is um, population retention and keeping yeah. pop people in, in population. So you could have the argument, is it better to have six families in six very small crofts, um, or do you have one person making a more, you know, a better agricultural economically viable unit out of six crofts? So I think it depends on what you're, you know, to be clear about what your objectives are, what it is you're trying, trying to achieve, and being realistic about what is possible on the ground, because, you know, you could get six families into that, uh, that community, but there may be no jobs, or there may be no housing, or, you know, all these sorts of things um, come into play as well. Um, okay. Uh, Donald, I'm, I know you're going to have strong views on this, and I'm not, we'd, we'd be delighted to hear them. Yeah, I, th I think um, the process is working, um, and uh, like Lucy mentioned, um, it has focused on absenteeism at the moment, which um, is is obviously the, the easiest one to deal with because it's easy to measure um, the distance away from the croft. Um, and I think the the way forward for it really is. Uh, reminding crofters about their responsibilities and their duties as a crofter and trying to find ways of um, 
uh, crofters dealing with this themselves to sort out their situation, whether that would be um, entering into, like, um, getting a, uh, arranging a sublet of their croft so that they're then fulfilling their duties. And that we see that as a way for young crofters to get into crofting um, rather than the Commission having to go through a pro process of um, removing a tenant from a croft, which will obviously take uh, a lot of resources and time. Um, so really, I think I think that this is about um, encouraging crofters to sort this out themselves, um, but obviously with the the sort of overlying threat that the commission may step in at some point. Yeah. Trick. Um, <clears throat> I think what Donald's saying is is really really pertinent. That, that this is something that that can be dealt with um, to an extent in in the communities themselves. I think um, the point that, that Stu is making about about absenteeism being important to the community, or rather occupancy being important to the community, and absenteeism um, damaging communities is is a really Im important point. I know that in in our submission to the to the bill, um, we also the same as the NFU made made the point that neglect is is probably more important than absenteeism. So saying, um, absenteeism does affect, affect communities. I mean, we're, we're very much against amalgamation of crofts and enlargement of crofts. And, and that's something that, that can happen from absenteeism. That if, the, if too many crofts are left um, unused, that the temptation then is to, is to amalgamate them. And, and then, as Lucy said, you've only got one family then instead of a potential of six or ten or, 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 or however, however many, which is... Um, something that's, that's almost a, a, a definitive aspect of crofting, that crofting has, has um, populations in, in remote areas. So that's a, a, a very important point. Something, this ties in as well with um, the community mapping idea that we're talking about, because crofting communities, if they, if they map their assets, um, they can see, see then which crofts aren't being used, which crofts are, are, are absent, and, and they, the community, can decide what, what, what are we going to do about this. And, and very often, I think it's, it's about incentive. It's about asking the Commission to help um, bring crofts back into use, to, to provide support to, to people who have crofts and they're not using them. You know, we used to have a, a crofting um, new entrance scheme, and, and, you know, maybe there wasn't enough um, money involved in it, but everyone remembers it as something that, that, that was a positive force in, in getting people to give up crofts that they weren't using because the, um, the new entrance scheme staff would actually go out and talk to crofters and, and, and help them and, and explain you know, that the, the, there are people out there that want the tenancy of your croft and we can help you to pass that tenancy on to a young person like, like, like Donald, for example, and, and don't be scared of this. And a lot of people, I think, are sitting on crofts because they're, they're worried. They don't know how it all works. So it could be a positive thing. Okay. Uh, b before I come to you, Murray, uh, John wants to, to add something to this. Right. Well, uh, I, I'm a complete outsider to this. I live in a city, so I do not know about crofting, and this is fascinating listening about it today. But as an outsider, I'm just uh, interested in especially what, Donald, some of the things you were saying. I mean, we don't, we don't tell people in the city how to use their land. We don't tell, as far as I'm aware, farmers how to use their land. Why should we tell crofters how to use their land? Um, I, I mean, I th it's a good question. Does anyone want to? Ju I mean, Patrick, if you want to, if you if you want if you want to be brave and stick your head above the parapet, could I ask you to do it shortly, and then I'm going to ask Murray and and, and Peter to come in mm. on, on on that point and the other point. So, Patrick, very briefly, if I very very briefly, I would just say, well, look at council housing and housing associations. They do tell tenants how to how to treat their, their, their houses. And, and tenants can be evicted for lack of use or misuse of, of a public asset, like a council house or a housing association house. It, it's the same thing. It's a regulated system. OK, that's a very good answer, actually, Patrick. Murray. John Mason asked a very, very probing question, which goes right to the heart of why the crofting legislative system is the way it is today. And that's a big political football to, to kick around, but it's one that I would urge you all not to lose sight of. 
I'm not going to supply the answer, except to say that uh, Scottish Land and Estates' attitude is simple, simple, is good. Understandable, predictable, is good. So any system that leads to uncertainty is not good. Lying behind Stuart Stevenson's question uh, was, is absenteeism the big elephant in the room? Is that the big problem? SLE's view is, no, it's absolutely not. At an earlier stage, SLE had said use is more important. That's a view that's already been, been mentioned, um, and that, that remains the situation. What Donald has described is really, really pertinent, and you need to be aware of that, that within the current regime, because absenteeism and land being put to a purposeful crofting use in terms of the, the legislative parlance, schemes are devised to ensure that absenteeism isn't a problem. And what's the end result of those schemes? People like Donald, as Donald has said, are being given the use of a sublet of a croft. Now, you can argue the rights and wrongs of that, but is, is there a big problem? I don't think there is. If you were to ask somebody from the Crofting Commission to, t to, to give you uh, statistics around absenteeism, I think they would tell you from the census that there is around 800 or so uh, absentee crofters. Now, I've heard that figure anecdotally. If you've got just under 20,000 crofts or 19,500 crofts, you might think that's a big problem. If the pressure were to be increased and something done about the absenteeism, what's going to happen? Are there 800 people looking for crofts? Patrick would tell you how many people he's got on, on his organisation's books looking for a croft. It's not 800. Is it a problem? No. Scottish Land and Estates are working with the... the, the recently, I, I met with the previous uh, chair of the Crofting Commission, and she was asking if Scottish Land and Estates have members who would be willing to work with the Commission in identifying uh, crofts which are vacant or have fallen into neglect and that's a process that Scottish Land and Estates are actively looking at. We're canvassing members to say can we actually help solve the problem because it's in no one's interests for land and crofts to be sitting un un unused. But is this the biggest problem? No, it's not. Thank you. Uh, Peter, if you've got something fundamentally different to add, I, I, I would welcome <coughs> it, um, but I, I would I ask can, you to keep find, it as short as possible. No, I, I think that coming back to Stuart's original point, I think both residency and use are important. I mean, you could have people who are resident but not using, and that's as much as a problem, in fact, more of a problem than people who are absent. So both are, are significant. Um, when we looked at the crofting from our members' point of view, cr creating new crofts, and we would say there is a demand for new crofts, and there's nothing more frustrating than somebody wanting a croft and seeing an abandoned croft or a neglected croft or just an underused croft, and that creates real tension. That partly answers John Mason's point. That's why, in the modern day, you require people to use purposeful use, because there are people who want crofts. I mean, our members' experience is that when they have created new crops, which some have, the demand has been double what the supply was. So there's a person sitting behind me in the audience from the Ascent Foundation. They've recently asked for expressions of interest for new crops. And I think they've had 18 from the immediate locality, which is within a, a defined uh, area, similar to the absentee definition uh, of residency. Uh, and there's another almost 18 or 20 from beyond that area. That's a significant demand in an area, and we've found the same in Golson, we've found the same in Mull, where people have created crofts. Demand is running well ahead of supply, and we'll no doubt come back to the, the, the there's difficulties about creating new crofts, and we'll come back to that. But I guess that's the main point that answers John Mason's point, is that when there is demand, and we think there is, then uh, you need to make sure that the existing crofts are purposefully used or made available for other people to use. And in terms of the economy of an area, that's what's significant. For our members, creating new crofts is not, that doesn't add to their bottom line as a business. It, detract, it actually detracts potentially from their bottom line. There's, not, there's nothing in creating new crofts for a landowner in terms of their absolute financial bottom line. There's a huge amount in them, in it for the, the development of the economy, creating more units that are active, creating more disposable income in the economy, helping the supply chain for agriculture and for school places and so on and so forth. That's why these matters are important. Peter, thank you. Um, I just remind you, short is short. That 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 was quite quite long. Um, so. It, 
<laughs> well, may, may, maybe I, I, I will be spared the benefit of that today. The, I, I want to move on to the next question, if I may, which ties into this, which is, which is from Peter. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to ask the, the members about the, the fact that, that something like 28% of crofts are owner-occupied. And what are the panel's views about the measures in the 2010 Act which sought to ensure that owner-occupier crofters have the same rights and are subject to the same obligations as crofters who have remained as tenants? Uh, I'm going to ask Patrick to go first on that. And Sorry, I, I know you think I'm being difficult, but we have got a huge amount to get through, so, so the, the more succinct answers would, would, be, would be very much appreciated. Patrick. I think the point that you raise is really important that we need to look at what the intention of the legislation was. And um, the intention was that, that anyone who occupies a croft should be defined as a crofter, because prior to the 2010, a crofter was a tenant, whereas, whereas now they should be anyone who occupies a croft is a crofter, subject to the same rules, regulations, and privileges that all crofters enjoy. Which is going to have problems, which Murray's going to say, I think, by the look on his face. I am like the person who is sitting in the school exam and realises that their question has come up that they have revised and revised and revised for. So I thank Mr Chapman <laughs> for the question. The one thing that the, that the Crofting Sump uh, report talks about uh, is the need to, well, to my mind, is the need to simplify the problems around this owner occupation. I do not understand why owner occupiers still are working under the crofting regime. My big idea, and evidence will be coming in uh, about this and how this would work in practice, is that once someone, a, a crofting tenant, and remember when crofting started, it was a landlord-tenant relationship. Now, we've moved on. 40 years ago, right to buy was given. I'm not advocating right to buy being removed, but upon right to buy being exercised, why is an owner-occupier still within the crofting system? There is, it seems to me, no good reason for that to remain. There are details around what would happen with the common grazing share that pertains to that crofter who, and the croft that has a... He's exercised his right to buy, but when someone has exercised the right to buy, why should he be any different from any other landowner in Scotland? When someone exercises the right to buy or a council house when that regime was in play, did, did the local authority then have any say over them after that? No, they didn't. Why, sh why, why, should, why should there be any, why should there be any uh, change now? now there's been lots of clamour for simplification. And so the big news that I come to, to this committee with today is that if you want something to get your teeth into, make this change. There's, there's no amount of legislative um, change is, is going to solve the problem. Codification of the, of the legislation, it's, it's not hugely and wholly broken. Lots of people might disagree with that because they don't seem to understand it. But as a lawyer in private practice, it's not any more complicated than lots of other branches of Scottish legislation today. But this one thing would make a big, big difference. I go on to Peter, who I know is, is going to have views on this. Stuart just wants to add something. I just wanted to be clear, if SLE are thereby, in that statement, opposed to the imposition of real burdens associated with the sale of uh, heritable uh, assets, because that's what I appear to be hearing. Uh, th that's a question that I can't answer, um, and I'm happy to, to take that away. I, I've come with my hat on as chair of the Crofting Group, so I, I, I'm afraid that I, I, can't su I can't supply an answer here. Maybe, sorry, maybe we could ask you, uh, we'll ask you to submit an answer to that in happy writing. To, yes. Peter, I... Uh, well, I'm, just before we move on, if, if, if I could ask Murray, does that mean that, that you believe that, that crofters who have now bought their, their, their crofts shouldn't get the extra grants that are available to crofters? You know, there are, there are, other, there are, there are advantages to being recognised as a crofter as well as, 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 you know, maybe potential difficulties. You're saying they should be treated as any other landowner. Does that mean that the extra grants that are allowed in the crofting areas would, would go away from, from these folks? 
if I might be permitted, convener, to give a political answer, um, I will come back with the detail of that uh, in, in, in a written submission, because that, that is a practical problem. If someone's taken a grant as a crofting tenant uh, under the current regime, within a certain number of years, it has to be repaid if the, the ownership goes somewhere else. Now, there's detail there, and I, and I don't want to befuddle the issue just now with, with detail, but I want to come back in evidence with a fully thought through. But uh, as a clean sheet scenario, why should they be any different to any other landowner in any other part of Scotland? Murray, you, you're going to come back and you'll specifically, when you're thinking about that, think of things like the crofting, crofters' bull scheme, uh, house grants and all those things that, 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 that are pertinent. I'm going to go to Peter and then I'm going to come to Lucy. I'm going to um, obey your encouragement not to answer a question. And, okay, and, perfect. But, but, Thank but, you. But Murray, having said that, I have to say, say I am instinctively nervous about Murray's approach to this. Now, I'd have to really think hard about why that is, but it's partly caught up in Stuart Stevenson's question. But uh, I mean, I, I think that's a, it's a very fundamental issue about the entire crofting system. The legislation was only approved five years ago to make the situation as it is today. And I would be extremely cautious about moving away from that without some very, very fundamental thinking about that and the impact on the entire system. OK, Peter, as, as you haven't, unlike Murray, had the chance to revise on this and, and, and beg for the question to come up, I'm sure you, you, we would welcome a written response by the time you've had a chance to consider it. Lucy. Just one um, small point of clarification for uh, Peter Chapman is that um, in the recent um, new SRDP, there is now a small farm scheme. So um, it could be that a, a crofter who stops being a crofter would then be eligible for the small farm scheme. Just that. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that they're, they're necessarily excluded from the grants that are available. Uh, Donald's got something to say. Um, I'm quite concerned by uh, the suggestion that um, owner occupier crofters would come out of crofting. And I think um, it sounds like it could lead to um, the breaking up of crofting communities. You know, if you have one croft that's in crofting and then the next one is an owner-occupier one and is no longer a croft. Um, I think that could lead to the fragmentation of um, communities and the townships and I'm uh, quite concerned about it. Okay. Um, sure, sorry, can I just add a very tiny uh, comment? Yes. Just, just in a, yep, an answer okay. to this. I think that we need to be led by crofters on this and I think Lucy, um, her organisation, certainly ours as well, um, have our mandate from our members who say that they want crofting to remain a regulated system. Okay, um, that, that comment's noted. Mari, I think you've got a question you'd like to, to go with. Yeah, you've already mentioned some of the recommendations that came out of the crofting law, uh, some f uh, final report, and uh, I believe that there were 57 issues identified uh, that need to be resolved in crofting law. So it's just really to ask each of the members if you agree with those 57 issues that were raised if that covers the majority of the technical issues that there are and or would there be any other issues that you'd be aware of that that should be looked at as part of that and um, i mean that that that's quite a detailed and, and in-depth question. And if there are issues that you think about subsequent to the committee meeting and, and giving evidence, we would, of course, welcome those to be given to us in writing because it is, it's, it's quite a, a, a chunky one. That Who would like to start on that? Peter, happy well, to go well, with you. Quite briefly, I, I mean, these people who have been sitting looking at this for a long period of time are the experts in crofting law, and I would not second-guess them on that. If they say these are problems, they are problems, as far as we're concerned. These are... Uh, you know, most of these people have forgotten more about crofting than I've certainly ever understood. So I, th I think we should take them at their word on that. Uh, the, the, the issue for me is that this is a, a report about really about technical issues rather than policy issues. And you could tidy up all the technical stuff, but are there wider policy questions? And for us, there are, potentially, and we're still looking at the detail of this, and we'll, we will advise you about that in due course. But, for example, there are issues around the creation of new crofts that we're coming across that could be that are probably policy questions, but we've yet to bottom that out. There are issues potentially now around grazing committees and the clarity about uh, how they are governed and so on from recent events. Uh, and again, that's probably a, that may well be a policy question rather than a technical question. There are still issues around how difficult it is for crofters to get mortgages, uh, for example. Uh, so these are more policy questions, and I think that that's where I would suggest that there are there are perhaps a wider agenda of things, but for that agenda, I would go with what they are seeing. Um, 
to uh, Patrick? Um, I would agree with Peter on, on the fact that there was a lot of work went into forming the SUMP and a lot of organisations contributed to it. So, so I would say, yes, yeah, certainly it's probably 99% of, of what needs to be dealt with. I think the recent sort of stuff about common grazings um, has highlighted a couple of things about, about how committees work and, and so on. So, so eventually that will probably be something, there'll be points there that will be added to the sump. Um, and there's a, there was a, an interesting one that the recent stuff brought up where crofters appealed to the Scottish Land Court um, because that is the route for crofting appeals. And then the Scottish Land Court had to say, we can't make a judgment on this because we don't have, have the authority on this particular point of law. So that's, that's probably something that would need, need to, to be changed. I think Larry's question is, is appropriate in the sense that some of the people who are, who are involved in the SUMP report are coming in uh, to give evidence next week. And so I think it's very helpful she's asked this question and that you're responding so that we can ask those questions when we see them next week. So do, is there anyone else? Murray, you want to? As, as Peter and Patrick have said, I, I'll add our voice that uh, written evidence will come in uh, in an answer about this. But I've mentioned one thing already, owner <coughs> occupation, and common grazing doesn't really feature heavily at all in, in the sump. And that is a, a current issue. Um, but beyond that, there's, there's other issues too. Feature in, in a very short while. Um, can, I, can I just say that, it, uh, and just be, be, because we are pe seeing people next week, if there are things that you think the committee could helpfully have sight of or knowledge of before that meeting, you let us know. Um, that would be very helpful. I know it's a very short time scale, but it would be appreciated. Donald, did you have something? Or okay, L Lucy. I, sorry, I saw what happened. No, it's all right. It's okay. Um, it was really just. A, um, I mean, I think it is very comprehensive what the SUMP has come up with. But um, and yourselves and SCF and Nestle were, were partners in that group that, that drew it up. And it, but it was, it, you know, the, it was very technical, and it came from from the lawyers and from the Cofting Commission themselves and the sort of situations that they were coming across. Um, and maybe I don't know what you know what other questions you've got in coming up, but one of the questions again we asked in our in our recent questionnaire was about about crofting legislation. We asked our members if you know did they think it should stay it is it is be consolidated, be reviewed, simplified and modified, start again or abolished completely. And the vast majority, um, sixty percent, were in favour of being reviewed, simplified and modified. And I think it touches on, you know, a couple of times it's been mentioned in the session this morning about things that are in primary legislation that just shouldn't be there. So while the sum, there's great validity in what's in there, um, I think at the time it was written with the idea that, that these anomalies would, would somehow be sort of rectified, maybe through consolidation. I, I'm not sure that we, we had in our mind specifically that we actually were looking at simplification and mod, modifying it and being conscious of the policy you know, the policy aspects that we actually wanted to deliver through it. Um, so I think it's just something to bear in mind. You know, was there something there to look at consolidating the crofting acts? Um, or, or is what we're now looking at something more or less starting afresh, maybe not with a clean, completely clean sheet, but modifying and reviewing and simplifying what we've got? Um, no one's catching my eye. Murray, you had a follow-up about... Priorities. Uh, yeah, because it was obviously there were priorities identified out of that list of 57, and it was just really to get your opinions on that as well. If you think that those are still the priorities in terms of, uh, let you say, modifying that that legislation, or if you think in that period of time the priorities uh, have changed. Point of view, I think that the, I would repeat the point I made actually that. I think that the way they've narrowed it down is probably fine. Uh, I don't have a problem with all of that. It's the issues that have come onto the agenda since, and I think the grazings, the work that's going on in grazings at the minute, if that shows there is new bits of legislation or a different way of not just a technical change, but actually to do things differently, then I would give that a pretty high priority for, for reasons I'll come on to, no doubt. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, I'm going to leave it there. If, if Murray, are you happy with that? Um, I'm now going to turn to the issue of, of common grazings, if I may, and uh, I'm going to ask a question on this, if I may. Uh, and I want to stress at the, outs at the outset, I want to leave aside any uh, local issues relating to this and, and any uh, things that are going on at the moment. And really what I want is, is, is a feel from the, from, uh, 
from you is, is whether the common grazing is working right. There are issues I think that you may wish to talk to regarding the composition of the common grazing committees. Uh, the, as, uh, the, the split of the shares in the common grazings and whether it's right that those could be held separately to a croft. I'd be interested to your views on that. Um, I also think that uh, how, how the apportionment has panned out, whether that is now the best way to serve the community. And the final issue is, is, is the, the issue of how the money is held in there and the relevance uh, uh, in the Common Grazing Committee, the funds they have, and whether you think that there are issues relating uh, to tax and, and, how, and who is responsible for that. Now, there's a fairly meaty issues, and I would ask you, please, just to bear in mind that we're trying to get a feel for common grazings across uh, uh, the whole of Scotland and the Crofton County is not about individuals. So I don't know who wants to uh, start with that. Um, Peter's not shying away. I, I, I don't know whether he was scratching his nose, but it's coming to him first. Of all. Have the kick off. I, I think uh, this is a really significant issue for crofting and crofting communities, and I guess it comes back partly to the, the, the point that Stuart Stevenson was making earlier, and it's about how vibrant and active a crofting community is as a whole. And if you want to have vibrant, active, active crofting communities, which we do for econo broad economic reasons, you've got to have as part of the mix there an active grazing committee. And if you don't have that, then there's something missing from the community. And I guess that we are increasingly aware of the potential of common grazings that might not yet have been realised for a whole range of diversification purposes as well as for traditional purposes. And we know that there are many uh, grazing committees that are inactive or out of office and that uh, you know, ultimately that cannot be good for the system and so on. Um, so I, I think they're fundamentally important to the whole way in which the, the crofting sector and, and the crofting communities work, and that's why they require attention. I, I, I wouldn't underestimate the extent to which, without getting into the recent events, the recent events have made people really worry about what are, are, are the things that we've been doing, <coughs> doing in good faith, uh, doing with the consent of the majority in our community, are we now in danger in some way? Are we in jeopardy in some way from what we've been doing? And that all needs to be clarified. Confidence needs to be given back to the system. Now, there's work going on about that with the Commission, as I understand it now, and that will give a clue to the, much of the detail that you've touched on. I guess the other thing that, that I would have suggested, and it, it touches on other um, points that have been made already about the system as a whole, to me, how grazing committees work is largely a matter for the grazing committees. I mean, you know, where you see them at their best, these are common sense people doing common sense things with consent, and they should be left to get on with it. And you know, the, least, the less we interfere, the better. It's a kind of, it's a very localised form of democratic control of, of local assets, and they should be determining their own rules and procedures and operating. And only when they significantly are believed to have erred, m might there be some reason for intervention. But otherwise give them confidence to put the effort in to make sure their community is working effectively and give them a high degree of trust that what they're doing is common sense and, and logical and acceptable locally. Lucy, do you want, do you want to go on that? And, and maybe somewhere in there you could weave in whether you think you know, the common grazings uh, producing an annual report to the, to the commission is, is appropriate as well. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, We've recently done some work with members on Sky on looking at common grazings, and we've had a couple of workshops. Um, and as I said, we've just done this survey. I'd just like to read a, a couple of quotes for you, if you don't mind, from, from the survey. And these were. No, no. And as long no. as it's not too personal. Well. Or not personal at all. I think it, it just kind of illustrates the um, variation across, across the, the country. So the first one is, our common grazings have always been very well run and managed and has gained us a great deal through environmental schemes and through other means, <clears throat> and we would be very much worse off without it. The second one, and I'll say this is from mainland Scotland, so not from any of the islands, it is run by a clique of bullies who manipulate control and prevent new entrants from using the grazings effectively. The rules are made up to suit others, and the clerk is regarded as an overlord who tells everyone what to do. We tries to raise it and effect a change and use the regulations properly, but it's becoming very stressful and disheartening. Um, <coughs> just one more. <coughs> um, 
I cannot comment on the present, but my recollection when I was younger was that there never seemed to be a problem and people seemed to get along and agree much better. Um, and just in relation to the questionnaire, um, we did ask a question about um, were people shareholders in their common grazings, and one of them was how satisfied are you with your, how your common grazings is operating? So first of all, 54% reported that they weren't actually shareholders in a common grazing. Um, but those that did respond, 48% um, and 34% were either sa very satisfied or satisfied with how their common grazings were working. 8% had no comment, and only 10% were very dissatisfied. So I think it's important to remember, and maybe to put that in context, that um, while there has been a lot of press about common grazings, um, that's the, the majority, I would say, are working well. But I think there is an issue about rebuilding the confidence and taking for people forward um, with the confidence that they can work with their, their common grazings and, and that they can work well. And I think there are some overarching principles that need to be accepted. And Peter alluded to the work <coughs> both, um, I think, all the stakeholders here are involved in with um, the Crofting Commission in drawing up um, sort of best practice guidance for common grazings. That importantly, I think that there needs to be an attitude of openness and transparency. There should be some sound financial recording and accounting, and I don't mean full accounts as with a business, but as with any other voluntary group, um, and that best practice procedures should be followed. Um, I think there are issues about active and inactive shareholders. Um, I think that's a really crucial one, and how that circle is squared, as it were. Um, I think remuneration of grazing clerks is another. Um, I think they tend to be undervalued in the amount of work that they do. But ultimately, the committee should be answerable to their shareholders, and I think that's important. Um, okay. In terms of the grazings, re the, the, the report that um, grazings committees are under the duty to do, as far, I as, far as I understand, and um, the Commission will be able to confirm this, um, I'm not sure that any have actually been done yet. Um, and I think it will depend very much on how that grazing committee works locally as to how comfortable they feel about, about putting something in. I think... You know, much of this will very much depend on personalities on the ground. You know, within a community, you have a whole range of different personalities, and you will get people who will work well together and it works, and in other situations where it just doesn't. So that's just my Thank you. Donald, it would be interesting also to have your take on, on the point that Lucy just made about in inactive members with shares in the common grazing, so, you know, from a young crofter's point of view. Um, yeah, on, on that point, um, I think that does present an opportunity for, and, and on to your, your, um, your second question, which was around holding shares um, without a croft. Um, that is an opportunity for, for young entrants to get into crofting, as if, if somebody isn't using their share, um, that perhaps that could be used by a, a young entrant into crofting, and, a, and that could be an entry route in for them. Um, on grazings committees, um, I think um, P Peter made a good point there about how important they are for crofting communities and how they become a focal point within the township. Um, and although in the in the legislation and um, in the the draft the template um, grazing regulations that the crofting commission um, produce, um, their role is quite limited to uh, r um, running the grazings and regulating the grazings. I think there's a potential there for a wider um, development role within the township and I don't think that grazing committees should be prevented from doing that if there's agreement with the shareholders. An example might be um, uh, creating a, a, a silage park or something like that where it, it could produce, um, collectively produce uh, winter feed for their animals, that sort of thing. I don't think that, that's, um, <coughs> that that would be a bad thing for a grazing committee to be able to do but possibly might fall out with uh, current legislation. Um, and on your last point about how money is held, um, I, I don't see a problem either with the Grazings Committee holding um, money on behalf of the, the shareholders, if the shareholders are in agreement with that. Um, it makes much more sense than trying to recoup the funds when a project is uh, developed, like a, a building a fank or um, building roads to, to get the money from each individual shareholder um, would be very difficult. Thank you, Donald. Uh, Patrick, do you want to...? Uh, I agree absolutely with what, what Donald said, and he said it much better than I could say it. Um, <coughs> I would just add to it then, maybe, that um, 
that I think there's there's a lot of models, business models um, of social enterprise that could be looked at. And in fact, in the um, in the legislation, in the regulation, sorry, the grazing's regulation. Um, stakeholder meeting that has met once so far and it's going to meet again um, next week or the week after um, this this is something that came up in that, that that there are business models that grazings could adopt and that would help with this having a clear constitution um, how to manage money how to be accountable um, at, at you know at different levels of income so so I think looking at, at models that already exist could help a lot with how grazings um, work. I think um, on the whether you, the question about whether shares um, can stand alone and not be attached to a croft is an interesting one. Over the last few years, particularly, it's something that's been discussed a lot because it's certainly in common um, knowledge. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm not clear whether originally in the law shares were always a pertinent to a croft. This is what I was told, that shares were, were a pertinent to a croft. I, you had to have a croft to have a share in, in the grazings. And then over the last few years, it's been defined legally that, that um, shares can exist by themselves. So, and I think there's certainly the feedback I get from, from our members and that is that there's a lot of regret about that and, and that, that the, the original concept of shares being appurtenant to a croft was was favoured and it's it's caused all sorts of strange situations where where crofts um float float about um by them shares float about by themselves not not least in the um in the register of of crofts as well or the the, the um sorry the the crofting register you know where there's deemed crofts that can only be illustrated on a map by a cross, you know. I think Stuart wants to come, come back. Just this is new to me. Can shares be owned by someone other than a real person? If you don't know, you don't know. I would have to refer. That's all right. <laughs> refer That's all right. To a, to a lawyer. Um, if it's my Murray, turn, I'm, I'm going to bring you in. Anyway. I, I, yeah. I think, I think the, the point Patrick makes is. is, is and that Donald's making on these shares that are detached from the croft is that it, it may be preventing the, the full benefit of the grazings being enjoyed by the township. And, and, and certainly what, I, what I'm hearing is, is an expression which I thought we'd got round, which was slipper farming, but slipper crofting. I don't know if that's relevant, but Murray, perhaps you'd like to, to comment. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I think that Crofting Law Sump talks about that as being a specific issue that needs to be addressed. Um, so I think the answer is, is, is maybe there already. I had thought, if, you, if you'd pin me to the wall and, and ask me and ask me to answer the question, I don't think they can be held by a non-natural person. Um, but because uh, the authors of the report have said that needs to be addressed, then I would be inclined to think it's maybe possible. In practice, I'm not aware of it being a, 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 hu a huge issue or, or, or a concern. Um, SLE's position in relation to the question about should shares be a separate tenement um, or tied to a croft, SLE are broadly neutral uh, around that. But common grazings are really, really important because, uh, and again going back to parameters as to why or and what a common grazing is, it's a piece of land that is owned by a land owner, be that a community body or an individual or, or whoever, and there are rights given over that land. The problems that we've been alluding to and talking about specifically this morning are because there's been a shift and modern life has moved on from where the Crofting Act started, <coughs> a shift away from agricultural use of common grazing to diversification, into alternative energy use, into hydro schemes, into wind farms, into environmental schemes. And these are all part of modern day life in Scotland. Are the common grazing regulations fit for purpose where you've got a group of crofters who are doing the job um, because their father did it and their grandfather did it or their grandmother did it and they're being asked then to manage, in some circumstances, tens of thousands of pounds. Is it fit for purpose? No, it's not fit for purpose. 
this committee doesn't have this evidence in time in, in, a, in a vacuum. Uh, Patrick's already said there is work going on with the Crofting Commission, and Patrick and I are both involved uh, in looking at that and coming back to the model uh, and saying, are there things that can be done within the current regulations? And if there's not, then I suspect, uh, well, I, I know that there will be recommendations given uh, as to how the, the, the model could be changed. But, but uh, if I may, just one last thing, as regards, regards common grazing, it's really the key point where landowners can be and should be more engaged than they are in the, in the system, because they are, like it or not, they are invested in the system. It is their land. Now, are there more things that can be done to collaborate uh, with landowners by crofters? Absolutely. Is that something that SLE is promoting to landowners? Absolutely. To say that there should be, but it shouldn't be overlooked at the fact that in the current regulations and act, there is provision now for alternative uses on the common grazing, uh, and th there are schemes that are happening beyond the traditional take it out of common grazing for forestry. And these schemes are they, they are ongoing. So I'm not <coughs> suggesting that the legislation's broken, uh, f you know, far from it. But I'm just saying that there there's more that can be done, and I certainly would want to say to the to the committee. SLE are looking to promote that to, to, to their uh, members and to, to see the good results of that in, in future. I know Peter's got a supplementary uh, that you want to ask, and, and please. Yeah, I would, I would like to ask the panel, uh, just for clarification, I mean, I, I've, I'm, I've been a farmer for 45 years, but I farm on the East Coast, and I don't understand, I don't pretend to understand all the ins and outs of of the crofting system, but I'm interested to know who claims the CAP money, you know, BPS and environmental scheme money. Is that is that claimed by the by the grazing committee, or is that claimed by the individual crofter on his own right? I mean, how does that work? Before anyone answers that question, I'm looking for a definitive answer, and if we can't get a definitive answer, and the only reason I'm saying this is we we are three quarters of the way through our time, and we're we're halfway through the questions. Does somebody have a definitive answer, Murray? It's not the landowner. Uh, in my no. understanding, it would be um, the crofter would put the his grazing share on his um, IX form, and then that that would be part of his his payment. Um, but the grazing committee could claim SRDP money on the on the common grazing. How's that money held and then distributed to the various crofters involved? Well, is that that's difficult? that's really the, the issue for contention at the moment. Is that. Um, the suggestion is that it should be paid out immediately to the shareholders, but in most circumstances, I would imagine that it would be held by the grazing committee and then spent on development in the grazings, which which I would tend to agree with. And okay, yeah. Lucy, um, <clears throat> I think what that also raises there is a, there have been some fundamental issues about the disconnect between. Um, the rules and regulations that ARPID work under, under EU regulations, um, <clears throat> and what is required under crofting regulations. Um, and I think going forward, that disconnect needs to be looked at in some, some detail. Um, I mean, I don't know if <clears throat> some of you may have come across this report, which was done a number of years ago, Trends in Common Grazings, which was done prior to the latest SRDP. And in that, it, you know, it very much calls that crofting um, common grazings should be looked at in their, in their own right within the development of agricultural policy. Um, I have to say, I don't think that did happen, and they were kind of bolted on at the last the last minute. So I think there is some, and particularly as we go into a new a new era, era potentially in terms of agricultural support, there is an opportunity to look at common grazings in their own right and how they are best supported, depending on what what you want to achieve with them. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move on there, and I just thank you all for for, for keeping that in the way that you did and ask Richard if he'd like to ask his next question. Uh, um, to set the scene, the Crofton legislation stakeholder group was set up by the Scottish Government to consider the Sump report. number of issues, basically, unfortunately, no parliamentary time in session for to complete those. And now we have the Programme for Government 2016 commits to work, begin working on a national development plan for crofting. Can I ask the panel, have any of you been asked uh, or are you presently working on this national development plan for crofting? And if you are, what are your priorities for this plan? Um, Patrick, sorry. <laughs> um, no is the short answer to, to, we haven't been asked to um, 
work on a national crofting development plan yet, but the idea of there being a national um, crofting development plan is something that we put forward um, at the beginning of the last session of, of government, actually. So, so it's really heartening to see that this government is saying, yes, there does need to be a, a, a national plan. Um, we have put forward our five actions for crofting um, that, that, that came from a lot of discussion and debate and um, conferencing, um, not least in the conference that we held at the beginning of the of uh, the end of last year, actually, um, the future of crofting. And the five actions we came up with were um, targeting financial support, um, simplifying the law, making crofts available, um, making how croft housing available, and um, having a lead body on crofting development. Now, if I, if I could, sorry, just just go back to Shucksmith and this, this idea that crofting development was going to go to HIE. Actually, what, what the Shucksmith committee recommended was that there needed to be a unit set up based on the very successful um, community land unit that was, that was under HIE at the time. And the community land unit, I mean, Peter has been um, involved in this for a long time, and the community land unit has really helped to enable um, community buyouts. And so the vision was that crofting development would, would come under a, a unit su such as that. So it would be the crofting development unit. Can I ask you to focus? That the, the, you've asked the first part of the question, which was, have you been asked? And the, I, I believe the answer was no. And the second thing was, what are your priorities? I'm the, very the, happy. The, the I'm very happy priorities. if you want to leave it there rather than suggest the way you would see that implemented, because I, I suspect sure. the government may have views on that. Yeah, um, I'll, 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 I'll leave it there with the five actions. Would, would, would that be all right? I, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Peter, and then Lucy, and then Murray at the end, and no, Donald at the end. So you come last, Donald, but not least. Peter. Well, yes, we are. Uh, we, th we believe we're involved. We have been asked. We're part of the stakeholder group, and we regard that as the route into the development of the plan. We had a meeting with the minister a few weeks back and he was very keen to encourage us to say what we wanted to see in that development plan. We think it's a good idea to have that. I guess the question would be what goes into it and who delivers on it in the end of the day and as long as those things are, I mean, particularly who is responsible for delivering on that in the end of the day, as long as that's clear, we would have thought this would help drive the future of crofting. For our part, we want to see it in touch on how you create new crofts. Uh, how you support new entrants into crofting, the stuff we've touched on in the grazing committees, particularly how you make grazings, uh, or bring grazings into more purposeful use and, and more diversified use over time. Um, the crofting development point we, we would want to see, and in fact, the national plan implies that there should be some crofting development uh, effort into the future. Uh, and so on and so forth. So we've got a pretty clear agenda, but we think we've got the opportunity to push that through the stakeholder group, uh, and we're certainly not finding any barriers to making our point of view known. Lucy. Um, yes, I would just echo um, what, what Peter says, certainly through this, the Crofting Stakeholder Forum. Um, you know, as Patrick outlined, we have been working on, on these priorities. The, we, we set five initially, but we actually just um, in this last year have added common grazings as a, as a sixth priority um, to be worked on. Um, and currently, you know, members of the stakeholder forum, we've divided up into subgroups and each subgroup is working on, on a paper um, to bring forward. And certainly my understanding from Scottish Government was that that was to do the groundwork for a national development plan. So I, I think, you know, we are involved. I don't think it's been formalised, but that's kind of where we are. Stuart, very, very brief. I right. just wanted to check that Patrick organisation is part of the Crofting Stakeholder Forum that others are referred to? Yes, yeah, sorry, well, my answer so to you've been of, of no was, was, was just to that we haven't been formally asked to, to develop a, a national But you've been plan, exposed but, but to the same are, invitations and discussions and we are part well. of the group, yeah. That's thank, helpful, thank yeah. you. But if you were formally asked, you enjoy it? No, well, we are part of the group, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. M Murray? So, so just what Mr. Christ just said, our answer is the same. We're not officially formally asked, but we're, we're, we're very engaged. Um, in terms of priorities, um, as I, I hope I've tried to say, the land owner's interest in relation to a part of a croft, whether it's a tenanted croft or an owner-occupied croft, the landlord's role is limited. 
Always. Um, now, that doesn't need to say that the landlords aren't interested, but across the panel, um, well, th the three to, m to my left were perhaps more reactive than proactive, um, but collaborative working is important, and the common grazing uh, issue uh, is certainly uh, important to landowners, and as it happens, I'm charged with writing the paper for the stakeholders group, but we'll come back to that okay. on another day. Donald. Oh, sorry, I think we, we, we should let Donald have okay, his... his, his um, I, I don't attend the stakeholder group myself, but another member of the group does, and I'd imagine that they have been involved in the early stages of this plan. Um, I think we would um, probably have similar priorities to what Patrick outlined, um, basically the same around access to land, housing, um, those things. But I'd, I'd like to add on to that, that um, qu quite often when we're having these discussions, we leave out the agricultural side of things and that I think that any development plan for crofting should include agriculture and and uh, an emphasis on um, how crofts are going to be actively used and developing that uh, within the crofting counties. Right, sorry, Richard. Right, taking the, all you, you know, again, I've not got a lot of crofts in Nordingston and Belsong, but basically, um, and you have uh, been involved in this and Murray Machine, uh, said earlier about uh, when people buy, you come up with this, this view, which I think shocked about your, your colleagues. Have you, uh, the other, have, have any going to want to come up with a similar shocking proposal which uh, may, you may want considered over the next year? To resolve this issue? I'm not following your question. But Sorry. Well, do you have any proposal which, you know, we all know that there's problems. We all know it's, we've tried to address these problems over the years. You know, is there any, as someone who is not a crofter, is there any proposals that you think should be on the table in order to resolve these problems? Just to clarify, I think what, and Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, is you're asking over and above the things that you've talked about that's yes. already in your development plan. Is, is there other particular issues that you think are relevant that the committee should be thinking about? Sorry, I, I hope I've got that right, Richard. Yeah, I've always found that if you don't ask the right question, you don't get the right answer. So I'm asking you, Maybe the wrong one. if you've not been asked that question, is there anything that you would want seen on the Peter, table? I, I don't think there's a silver bullet that's going to answer the problem. It's a hugely complex system. The, the, the point I would only make, the only point I would make, and I don't know if you want to get into it or not, is the point I made right at the beginning, that there is a, the beginning of a much more fundamental philosophical debate about what is crofting for, how do you, is all the regulation necessary in the future, could it be administered in a different way, but these are very fundamental questions that would require an awful lot of debate, you know, over a long period of time, and, and the slate... Um, General Grazing Committee has published a paper recently, which I think is on the Crofting Federation's website, which is postulating some, um, or their view of a different way of looking at the future of crofting. And I don't, I don't think there's any doubt there is that kind of undercurrent of debate, but that is very fundamental stuff. I mean, I, I've certainly seen the, that uh, paper, and I'm sure other members of the committee have seen it as well. And I, and I think that the point you raise is incredibly valid. The problem is, in, in the time that we have left, I'm not sure we have, have the ability to go through that. And it will slightly, from our point of view as a committee, be down to the government to, 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 to give us direction. I mean, we will give them direction on the issues that we think they need to address, on whether they want to approach that philosophical debate as part of their review. Lucy, I'm gonna come back to you, and then um, I know because uh, Donald's point is actually leads very neatly into a point that Mike wants to ask questions on. So, Lucy, if I may come it's to you. A little point of clarification. I think the um, people from Slate are planning to send it the, their slightly revised report and, and a, a, as written evidence to this committee. Um, so, we should hopefully get that in as written evidence. I, I, I will look forward to receiving it with, uh, I'm sure all the committee have had a plethora of respond, uh, correspondence on, on Crofty. Patrick, if it's very quick, I would like to go to Mike then next. The way you posed the question was, is there a, a big um, breakthrough other than, than deregulating <laughs> Crofts? And I would say, I would just refer back to the Shucksmith final report, because I think it probably just came a bit early. And, and what the slate Crofters have very, very 
eloquently put together is is based on Chuck Smith's recommendations. And I think again, look at Chuck Smith because he he they were suggesting some quite radical things. I, I, I'm very nervous about solicitors when they give me the evil life. I'm not going to bring them in. So I, I will bring Murray in, but very briefly, if I may. I'm grateful. I'm surprised no one has advocated abolishing landlords' interests in Croft. That's all I'll say. OK, and on, on that bombshell, Mike. <laughs> My question is going to be focused on the future of government financial support for crofting. Um, Post-2020, I mean, we all realise that, of course, we are leaving the European Union, and a lot of uh, funding comes through the Common Agricultural Policy to uh, crofting support, and, of course, there are other issues as well, um, government support. The whole issue is this money after 2020, the, the, the whole point about this is that the Scottish government is going to be is responsible in the devolved legislation, entirely responsible for supporting agriculture throughout Scotland, but particularly uh, support for crofting in the crofting counties. So my question is really, have you as membership organisations thought, A, first of all, have you thought about what you want to see post-2020 for a completely new funding regime designed for the needs of the crofting counties in Scotland. So first of all, have you thought about it? And when do you think you're going to be in a position to be able to enlighten us um, as to what those positions would be? Because there's a money here, huge amount of finance. If you as organisations haven't thought about it, other organisations have and are doing. So, Lucy, I'm going to come to you first because I was, uh, when I was talking on Friday on behalf of the committee, I got waived uh, the NFUS policy on, on funding post-2020, so I'm sure you have a policy. Could you...? We do. <laughs> Tell us no, about it. it's in development. Um, I mean, obviously, the union... I mean, agricultural support is absolutely fundamental to our members, both crofters and, and farmers, and to the wider rural economy. I mean, we all know, you know, how the ripple effect, and, and when, um, as Peter will know, when farmers have money, they tend to spend it, so um, it does go wider into the rural economy. Um, the union, obviously, we're starting out in this process. We just recently produced two um, initial discussion documents. Um, others will come to pass you know, as time progresses. We're in the very early stages. We still have to consult more widely with our members, so I wouldn't like to come out and say this is a union position. I think you're absolutely right, it's going to come down to funding and how we initially secure that funding from the UK government. And then when it does come to Scotland, how it then is divided up between Scotland is going to be um, an interesting um, one fight, I was going to say, but that's probably not the technical term um, to come in. So certainly, yes, I mean, the union is, is forming our policies and, you know, we will take into account the, the needs of crofting and croft, our crofting members as well. But I, I don't think I can say anything more at, at this. As a supplement to that, I mean, there's two issues about the funding from, from... There's two methods this is going to happen. Either the UK government will ring-fence the money and, and, and give it to the Scottish government to spend, or it will come as the, as the Scottish bloc. At the moment, everything comes through the Scottish bloc, uh, and therefore the, the focus will be really on, on um, the Scottish government's decisions and how it operates. Do you have any information to, to su suggest otherwise? I think that is an absolutely fundamental point, because at the moment, uh, my understanding is that um, our share of uh, cap money that comes to Scotland is roughly about 16%. Um, if it's done through the Barnet formula, that would drop to 8 8.5%, eight uh, which is a huge, huge drop. And the 16% doesn't even begin to address um, the sort of um, issue that is still in, the, in, in there is about the convergence issue and that we've argued that actually Scotland should be getting a, a, a greater amount of that money anyway. So, um, yes, I think real concerns about A, whether it's ring-fenced, and B, we need to secure um, a, a pot similar, if not bigger, maybe, and one can all be always aspire than we currently get. But, yeah, very, very significant concerns about if the Barnett formula is worked. OK, rather, rather than confuse everyone, I am... Well, I'm going to confuse everyone. Peter, you're next. We're going the opposite well, uh, order. For the purposes of this exercise, I'm delighted to see that we have not got a policy on this. <laughs> so Perfect. I I Murray, do you have a... <coughs> OK. Patrick? Uh, we have policy in, in construction at the moment, so it's a, it's a really complicated 
issue, so, so it's going to take a lot of discussion. Um, there are some fundamentals. One, one is that you um, said very conclusively that we're leaving the European Union. The United Kingdom is leaving the European Union. I really don't want to get into a discussion <laughs> on that. Um, okay. we, we could do other philosophical... <laughs> We, we, we could do philosophical discussions yes. on, on all sorts of things. I will avoid that, if I may. Yes. What, what I think you're being asked is, have you identified the priorities for funding for crofting post-2020? Mm. And, and I'd like to try and stick to that, yeah. if I may, please. I assume that this is based, though, on the um, idea that Scotland may not be in the European Union, because obviously if we are still in the European Union, you know, things, things carry on as they the do. The review of farm payments so, in 2020. So yeah. We, uh, and, um, and the government we, will need to make a policy on that. So we, priorities we, are important. Yeah. Sorry. We, we have Sorry, found that, um, the, that the European Commission has been very pro-small small units. Small farmers, crofters, they don't necessarily call them crofters in, in European countries. But the European Commission, when it came out with its proposals at the beginning of this round of the CEP, um, was was putting forward a lot of things that were very pro small units, which which we were really pleased about. So, after 2020, we obviously want to see that again, and whether it's proposals being put forward by the Scottish government or or whoever, we we um, really want to see small units being promoted. This is a move, um, a general trend, I think, across Europe. The the the, the um, small units haven't been promoted enough, and and so so that is a fundamental that we really want to see. Um, another one is that is that the likelihood is is that budgets are going to reduce, which it, which whatever happens, budgets will reduce. So we want to see more targeting of of resources, clear clear outcomes identified. The SRDP, for example, uses public money probably in a much more um, conscientious and accountable way than the Pillar 1 um, basic subsidy um, scheme works. And so, so we would like to see, see more of that. Very specific outcomes identified that are good for, um, that, 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 that are good for delivering public goods and that crofters and farmers get paid public money to deliver public goods. So that's a, a fundamental. To add to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we haven't really discussed this recently as an organisation, um, but uh, we have over, over the years like, um, d discussed various elements of support. And I think, I think uh, going on recent events that the Brexit does it could present some opportunities for, for crofters to, to, for crofting to tailor um, the support to crofting. And uh, we shouldn't ignore that. Um, but on a specific example, um, on the there's a new entrance scheme at the moment um, for for people co coming into agriculture, um, which is um, I, I I might have this wrong, but um, I think it's fifty a fifty thousand pound grant um, for for new entrants, but it's an all or nothing kind of thing, um, so not it's not open to a huge number of people because it's a limited pot of money. Um, and perhaps there would be a potential for a, a smaller amount of money for uh, new entrant crofters and something like that could be developed and that's certainly something that SEF Young Crofters would support. Thank you, Donald. Uh, Lucy, you wanted to try and come back in briefly, I see. Um, I think it's just to, to bear in mind um, that even at the point where we leave the EU, we are still going to be, you know, if we want to trade with them, we are still going to be governed by their um, rules and regulations. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind that we can't, unlikely that we're going to be dis able to dismantle everything, certainly not straight away, and it's going to take a long period of time. Okay, just moving on then, if I may, because Patrick uh, introduced uh, a, an interesting concept, which I think leads neatly on to what Jamie wanted to ask. So Jamie, you were, you were going to ask a question yeah, I think, uh, like some of my colleagues, I admit that I'm not from a crofting background or indeed a farming background. I'm a sort of town and city boy, but this has been absolutely fascinating. One of the themes that certainly comes through is that it seems that crofters know best and that there's a general consensus that uh, listening to people on the ground actually doing this uh, it seems to be quite important to us as committee members. That's something I'll certainly take 
take forward over the next few weeks. Um, it does lead nicely into looking at the future of how we approach policy. Um, yeah, as you're probably aware, that there are still a number of small land hold, uh, landholders in Scotland uh, of, uh, who have the right to convert into a croft, although I'm interested to learn that none of them have done so to date. Also quite interested to see that some new areas have been added to the counties, some of them in my area, such as Arran and Cumbria. So I guess my question really, and it's to anyone, you don't need to go around the table necessarily because we're tight for time, is uh, should we be looking at crofting law and small landholders policy together uh, as part of a single strategy? And also, uh, how can we attract new crofters into some of these new areas as well, such as those in, in my area? Um, I'm not seeing anyone jumping at that. So, uh, oh, Patrick, you're always first into the fray. Um, <laughs> if, if I could ask you to keep it brief again, um, but I think important points, yeah. Oh, now I, that's, that's, sorry, now I'm thinking, how, how, how do I keep that brief? Um, we find that a lot of the work that we do in the Federation um, benefits smallholders as much as crofters. So, um, but we were set up to represent crofters, and crofting is a regulated system, so it is fundamentally different from smallholding. Um, how we encourage smallholders or indeed people creating new crofts to, to, to be to create them as crofts rather than um, than small holdings I would say the number one thing is to is to sort out the legislation so that it's simpler because it actually is good legislation it's just so complicated that it frightens people and the purpose of crofting is threefold really one is to protect tenants, two is to protect landlords, and three is to protect the land. And so it is a good system that we believe smallholders should be attracted to and want to become part of a regulated system. Um, <coughs> I'm going to go to Peter first and, the, and then Murray, I think, to be uh, interesting. I mean, my... Please. My strong instinct is not to combine them, um, you know, unless all of the smallholders, and there's not a huge number, actually express the desire for that. Because I think that the, you know, the, one of the things that we are exploring with our members is, is crofting the only way of creating new tenancies? And how do you satisfy the demand that we think there is, not just in the Highlands and Islands, but throughout Scotland, for people to get access to a wee bit of land to do with what they want. Now, people are there's quite clearly a, a large, a significant number of people are, are driven by the desire to be able to do things on the land, to feel attached to the land, and to do so in, in terms of agriculture and production and so on. So how do we do that? And crofting is not the only answer. Uh, there are other answers, uh, and it depends on the particular circumstances and what you're ultimately trying to do. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't automatically combine them, but the fact that, that further attention is required on the whole question of small holdings and how you create more small holdings, I think is something that we've not, as a society in Scotland, spent enough time talking about and doing. Murray. I don't disagree with anything that Peter has said. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, um, people being attracted into crofting, which... Round the table today, we've perhaps got a view that it's this really complex system. Who's going to vote to come into that? Unless people like us, um, as we do, are able to say, it's actually not that complicated, you just need to get your head around it and take advice and go, go, go forward into it. But there need to be incentives. And there need to be, there's, it's good that this committee asked that question because there are other issues around rural life in Scotland as to why people don't want to live in, in rural areas. Um, so that, that's really back to, back to you guys. I don't think the answer completely lies in, in rolling out the crofting system, which is why I agree with Peter. I think that it's, uh, unless people are clamouring for it and uh, Scottish land and estates are not clamouring for it, I think it just st stays as is and we'll go forward. Donald and Lucy, unless you've got something particularly at opposing views to that, I, I, I would suggest I'd like to leave that there, if that's all right with, with, with you. Are you you're happy with that? Perfect, then. I want to move on to the next question, which is John, um, and he's got a question on legal matters, I think. Right, well, I think, I mean, this is now the winding up session, if you like, or pulling it together. 
uh, and I've got a couple of questions. I think Gail's got one uh, as well. So, I mean, from what we've listened to, the, the real question is where do we go from here? We, Parliament, oblique government, as far as legislation is concerned, and I've already heard some of that, especially from Lucy, um, the whole concept that we want to review, simplify and modify uh, the law, which sounds good to me. So I, th I think we're facing a one or two choices, and so I'd be interested in your views on that. I mean, it, I get the impression that the 57 or slightly less number of these kind of sump technical recommendations, there's kind of broad agreement, and we could probably move on that fairly quickly without too much uh, excitement. Um, and of course, one option would be to do that quicker and then look at the kind of longer term Peter uh, policy stuff over the next 10, 20, 30 years or something like that. Um, or do we try and put all of that in together within the next five years? And I mean, the next five years, in my opinion, means the next four years because you do not want any legislation going through in the final year of the parliament because it gets rushed and it's messy and you don't want to be there. Um, and you can quote me on that if you like. And um, so, I mean, that, that, does that make it too short a time scale to get it through by, say, summer 2020? Um, now, consolidation's been mentioned as well, but, but and I've been involved in a consolidation bill before, but that is very much putting the existing law just into a different format. I don't get the impression that's what we're looking at here. Everybody's wanting a bit of policy change. Can you give me thoughts on that? Um, I don't know who wants to start on that. Um, I think I think John's neat, neatly done my job, and I, I should probably step down. But uh, uh, who'd like Lucy? Would you like I'll, to? I'll, start? I'll kick off. Um, I think what what you summarised there is absolutely vital, and and it's not something that we've consulted our members on specifically in terms of the timing. So this is just my initial initial thoughts at this stage. I think what we need to um, consider in in this is that. Crofting legislation reform is urgently needed. Having said that, I think the priority must be in the development of, of good legislation. Um, and I think, certainly from our members' point of view, there has been a criticism of the Scottish Parliament that sometimes that isn't always the case, um, that good legislation comes out, particularly when things are, are hurried. Um, I think the question about the, the sump issues is one that you should put to to potentially the lawyers when you when you, when you speak to them, um, because I think there are things that lawyers and, and Murray will <coughs> maybe be able to comment on this are dealing on a daily basis, which you know they're pulling their hair out. They need these things resolved now. Um, so I'm not going to, if you give me, I'm not going to say one or the other. Um, I think what you you say is absolutely pertinent. My concern is yes, we want things done urgently, but it's got to be done. It's got to be done well. Um, so there's going to be a trade-off. Donald, I'm going to come to you next, if I may, please. Um, I'd just like to add that um, I think in this process going forward, um, crofters, crofters really have to own this piece of legislation like, um, as you go forward, that um, you really need to go to the crofters and see what um, their views are and make sure that they, they have an input into this process, and not just through the membership organisations, but ordinary crofters themselves. Um, that that's, that's quite important. That you'd rather maybe wait a bit longer and get it right, uh, even um, if it meant you weren't young anymore. Well, <laughs> well, um, possibly yes. I, I think I think it, it it really does have to be right this time around. And and if there was any sort of suggestion that it was going to be rushed, then maybe I need to take a step back. But um, but I, I do think that it's important that um, that you do listen to crofters in this in this process. Uh, just picking up on that, and again going back to the Shucksmith report, it was it was the biggest inquiry for um, for 50 years into crofting. So so crofters were consulted, and, and certainly need to continue to be consulted. I think the whole idea of participation is is absolutely vital. You know, if if people feel they're part of something, then it then it will work. Um, I think this this the question of do we have a consolidation act or do we have a new act? Um, we're certainly of the view that there needs to be a new act. But the thing that's, that's important about consolidation or new act is that we have one act. That's, that's the point. The, at the moment, we're dealing with 
um, an act amended by an act, amended by an act, amended by an act. And so it's, it's really difficult to, to get your head around um, any part of the legislation, which, which comes to the simplification. I think the, the quest for simple legislation is, it, it always comes up that we want crofting legislation to be simplified, but it always strikes me as a very interesting question. What is simplification? Because I, I think actually what, what often people mean is that they want clarification. Because to, to put something over that people can understand doesn't necessarily mean that you use much less words. Um, it's about putting it over in a way that people understand it. That's, that's the fundamental thing that's wrong with the legislation. The kind of overarching principles and less of the detail? Yeah. Or does it mean it's, something else? It's, I, think, I think it's... As I said earlier, the, 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 the act, the legislation as it's written at the moment is far too prescriptive. There's all sorts of detail in it that doesn't need to be there. Um, so the act itself could be simpler if it was more um, overarching, if it was wider, more, more general. But it's the clarity of it that's the important thing, not, not how many words are used in it or how many sections there are and what refers to what. It's the clarity of it that it needs to be easy to read. I mean, if, I don't know whether you've had a go at, at it, but the way it's the way it's actually written is is really strange. So so, um, and then the other thing I would just add is that that because I think that can be sorted in the term of this government, it can definitely be sorted. Um, and the other one is is the formation of a national plan for crofting can certainly be sorted in this in the term of this government as well. Okay, Stuart wants to come in. I think what you're saying is is. is the guidance that supports the legislation mm -hmm. is, is the critical thing to, to, to make it easier to understand. Stuart, sorry. I, I just wanted to make a, a technical point about parliamentary process. If it's a consolidation act, it is forbidden that it changes any of the policy. And just perhaps so we should all bear that in mind when we use that term. It leads on to what I wanted to say, which is if you're changing legislation and you're bringing in overarching principles, welcome to 20 more years of the land court interpreting what those principles actually are. I don't hear anybody shouting for that. So if it's codification, then that's simple. And unfortunately, it's detailed because <coughs> it's a complex system. It has become a complex system where there's lots of definitions, but it's all here in the sump report. Everything that's been identified as the potential tweaks that need to, be, to happen now, it's here. It's not, <coughs> I would venture to suggest, rocket science to be making those changes in, uh, in legislation just now, which perhaps, in terms of the detail, needs a, a Crofton Reform 2017 Act to deal with the detail, followed by a Consolidating Act uh, to bring it all together, Crofton Consolidation Act 2018 or 19, uh, and, and so we go forward. But the bigger point that I want to make is that it's... <coughs> Not worrying, that, that, that's the wrong word. It, it's unusual that we're talking about legislation being changed um, and that's driving the process. Legislation, I would have thought, is to deal with a social problem that, that's arisen or because the lawmakers of the land want to change social policy. Nobody's suggesting that social policy really... Seriously, none, none of us have said that apart from one or two ideas coming in there. Nobody's really really talking about that. So I'm not convinced um, that there is a need for, for new legislation unless we're going off in a completely different direction, a, a big high-level legislation of the type that Patrick talks about. Right, but you, but you are Saying that we need legislation for the sump report stuff. Well, oh, 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 it would be uh, farcical, frankly, to have the, this, the sump having come up with all these ideas where legislation needs to be changed mm. for everyone then to ignore it. Yes. That, 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 that would be nonsense. Mm. Right, so we do need that legislation, but maybe we don't need anything else immediately. Well, un unless there's a big idea. Right, okay, that's right. I'm going to come to Peter, and then Gail's got a question uh, I, I to bring it together. It's, it's actually quite unusual, I would have thought, to have a 57 clear items specified for a bill externally. So, I mean, Parliament's got a very clear guide on that. Now, whether it's the 57 or the, the priorities within that, the nine things that need to be dealt with, that's, I mean, government have to decide that and how they use it and deploy the resources. You know, de dealing with that 57 amendments, that, that, that's not an insubstantial amount of drafting time that you're taking up with all of that. Maybe less policy time, but there'd also be policy time as well. 
Uh, and if the government decided to only do that, then they would have, you know, they would have made progress against the agenda that people think is a very real agenda. Um, but you'd still be making 57 changes, if it'd be more changes, but you know, based on 57 items, to what is still a hugely complex system. Uh, and and the bigger, wider question about, you know, is there some other way of narrowing down? You know, and protecting the fundamentals of crofting, about secure tenancy, about independently setting rents, about succession, but leaving an awful lot of the of the detail to, um, to you know, to, to more discretion, potentially by a decentralised system. You might be able to think about a decentralised system within the next four years, but whether you could rethink the entire crofting system within four years, you know, that's a big ask. I would have thought. I, I was getting the 57 out of the way first. Well, part of me says it would tidy up the system, but, I'm, but you're still left with a hugely complex system. And it's not addressing what is unquestionably a debate that is emerging about do we need all this regulation? And, and, and I mean, there's, a, a, there's not just do we need different legislative framework, leaving aside the 57 and the tidying up, uh, but it's also how do you administer that, that system? And it's interesting, the slate crofters who have produced this paper, which I, you know, I think re would require a, a lot of work before it was an implementable system. Nonetheless, it postulates a scenario that sets out a different way of looking at the world, but they are looking at the world in a, a, how you administer what is essentially the same crofting regulation. So, you know, the, 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 the bigger questions are very big questions. For a system that's, you know, existed for over 100 years and was set up with very for very particular reasons, you know, to fundamentally change that would require a lot of thought. That's not a reason for saying that sh thought shouldn't be given. Uh, and, you know, government's going to have to decide, ultimately, where do we put our effort? Do we put our effort into tidying up the complex system or do we put our effort into rethinking the system? To the problems for us. Indeed. Well, indeed. Sure. <coughs> The final question, if I may, is, is from the Deputy Convener, Gail. Thank you, and it's, it is very final, unless Stuart wants to jump in again. <laughs> um, he's not going to be allowed to. <laughs> I just want to tidy everything up by um, saying thank you. We've covered a lot of issues, and you've certainly given us a lot to think about and consider, that's for sure. And it was good to hear differing views, but you know, quite a lot of consensus as well, I think, as to how we should go forward. Um, and we've talked about enacting the uh, recommendations of the SUMP report, but just to wrap up, are there any further priorities that you think a uh, future crofting bill should address? And, and just to help you all and focus your mind just while you're thinking about that, I would ask you to limit your answer to one and from each of you in turn, if I may, and if I could go to Peter to identify the most important one that you would like to bring to our attention. Uh, we think if, if our war and work shows that there's legislative re change required to assist the creation of new crofts, and we suspect there might be, it would be about creating new crofts. And then I'd put grazing committees next. <laughs> in your time in this parliament. Lucy. <laughs> um, Peter made the comments about is the legislation driving the policy or the, dri the policy driving the legislation? But... Um, and I think it, it has to be the policy driving the legislation, but I think legislation is just, it's just so huge that, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be looked at. Okay, Donald. Uh, it's difficult to pick one out, um, but I, I, would, I would actually agree with Peter that it's the creation of new crofts that is the most important thing to be looked at. Okay, Patrick. Well, because they've already said it, I don't need to say it, so I'll say something else. <laughs> um, that... Uh, the, the crofting asset mapping, participatory work within the communities is absolutely fundamental to, to taking anything forward with crofting. Okay, Murray. That's not a legislative priority. That's a funding priority that, that Patrick just uh, mentioned. I'll accept but, a funding priority. But, but, and, but and, I, I, would, I would agree, I, I would agree with, with what, what he said. If I had to pick one, because I've already given you another, about owner occupation. If I had to pick one, and I'm not necessarily pushing this from an SLE point of view, but common grazing is, is an issue. Okay. Um, I think, uh, as Gail promised, and as I, I promised that I wasn't going to let Stuart in, that is all the uh, questions that uh, we'd like to ask you. Um,
I don't think I'm going to give you the opportunity as I may because I think you've just had it to come back at us. I would ask you, though, if there is any information that you feel that we ought to consider um, as part of what we're doing at the moment to, to correspond with us through the clerks, and we will make sure that that goes out. I would like to thank you all uh, for coming here and giving evidence. I'd particularly like to thank everyone in this room for making this a conversation and an inquiry about uh, actual problems rather than personalities and I think it's important that we keep it that way so thank you very much for your time um, that really concludes today's meeting and our next meeting on the 9th of November of the committee will hear further evidence on the crofting in the form of a, a crofting law panel of experts thank you very much and I'd like to now close the meeting thank you, thank you.